At the time of the Great Jubilee in the year 2000, I was working in the Vatican in the office of Pope John Paul. So I saw all the Jubilee celebrations at very close quarters, and I was involved in the preparation of some of them. The number and complexity of the Jubilee celebrations was incredible. The whole thing was a vast operation moving in many directions at the one time. But at the end of it all, Pope John Paul wrote this in his letter, Novo Millenio in Eunte. If we ask what is the core of the great legacy the Jubilee leaves us, I wouldn't hesitate to describe it as the contemplation of the face of Christ. So according to the Pope, all the complexity of the operation reduces to this. The Jubilee was, at its heart, a single great contemplation of the face of Jesus. The same could be said of the Second Vatican Council with its many documents. It was, at its heart, a single great contemplation of the face of Jesus. So too the long and prodigious pontificate of Pope John Paul II. It was, at its heart, a single great contemplation of the face of Jesus. Now you may wonder why this stress on the face of Jesus. To speak of the face of Christ is to speak of the incarnation, the great truth with which Christianity begins, the truth that the Word was made flesh, that God became one of us. In the early years of the last century, a French Catholic writer claimed that there was a widespread denial of the incarnation even among the devout, he thought. He claimed that this was a disaster because if we deny the incarnation, we end up saying that to find our way to the divinity, we have to deny or escape from our humanity. But once we accept the incarnation, we see that we can find our way to the real divinity only by entering more and more deeply into our humanity. To deny that God took flesh is to deny the flesh. And to deny the flesh is to end up denying not only our humanity, but the goodness and beauty of the creation. All of this is caught up in the contemplation of the face of Christ. We immerse ourselves in the fact and mystery of the God who takes flesh. The Pope takes up the text of John's Gospel where some Greeks approach Philip in Jerusalem and say, we wish to see Jesus. Now throughout the Gospels, much is made of seeing Jesus, but not everyone who sees Jesus really sees him. They may see him physically, but they don't recognise the truth of what they're seeing. The classic case is King Herod in Luke's Gospel. We're told that Herod had long wanted to see Jesus and was keen to see him work some miracle. Jesus, however, doesn't play Herod's game. He works no miracle and he doesn't speak a single word. Herod sees without seeing. Those who see Jesus only as a role model don't really see Jesus. Those who see him just as a wise teacher or a miracle worker don't really see Jesus. Only those who see the crucified and risen Jesus the one who is among us as presence and power here and now really see Jesus. In contemplating the humanity of Jesus, his face, we end up discovering his divinity. His is not just another human face in the crowd. It's the face of God with us. This is the face of the one who comes to meet us in the Gospels which are our prime source of knowledge about Jesus and the prime locus of our encounter with him. It's been said of Jesus in the Gospels that he is, I quote, as direct and as distant as lightning. The paradox of directness and distance picks up the play of humanity and divinity in the Jesus of the Gospels. He is the one who is authoritative, extraordinarily so, but without ever being authoritarian. And he's the one who is intimate, extraordinarily so, but without ever being matey. To contemplate the face of Jesus is to contemplate the face of the one who hangs on the cross, a face of sorrow, as Pope John Paul says, 
a face in which we see all the tears and wounds of the world. Yet it's also the face of the one who, even in the moment of the most intense agony, entrusts his spirit to the Father. As he dies, he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. These are the words not of a man who has been swept unwillingly to a death he has resisted to the end, but of a man who has accepted this appalling death in obedience to the Father's will, and out of love not only for the Father, but for the human race whose fate depends upon this death. But there's more, as Pope John Paul points out. Because even on the cross, Jesus' perfect union with the Father is, the Pope says, by its very nature, a source of joy and happiness. The experience of joy and suffering, bliss and pain, is something we see at times in the lives of the saints. But what we see in them is supremely true of Jesus on the cross. But we can't stop at the contemplation of the crucified, because he's also the risen one. On his face, we see eventually the glory of the life which is bigger than death. St. Paul speaks of the glory of God which is on the face of Christ. And that glory is the glory of the resurrection. It's the glory glimpsed by the disciples in the moment of the transfiguration, when the face and the garments of Jesus shone with a light not of this earth. When he rises from the dead, Jesus loses none of his scars. They're all there on his face and on his body. The difference now is that his scars shine like the sun. That's the light of Easter that we see on the face of Christ. We are called to be witnesses. And a witness is someone who has seen something and who can therefore speak the truth. We will be witnesses to Jesus only if we have seen his face and heard his voice. Unless we have met him, we have nothing to say to the world. But if we can enter into the experience of contemplating the face of Christ, as the ear of grace calls us to do, then we will be able to speak the truth to a world which, even without knowing it, wants to see Jesus. Jesus.